if you are never training tempo or pause or one and a quarter squats and you're only doing these bouncing out of the bottom out of the hole you're missing a huge component of training mm -hmm. and uh, so I think there's you know, there's a huge place for making sure that some of those things aren't always done for time because again the incentive is there to let's avoid the eccentric phase so we can get down through the rep faster Barbell Shrugged, I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson. We're hanging out with Dan Pope and Ryan DeBell here in uh, Encinitas at Physical Culture. And uh, you, you guys came out here basically to talk about pec tears. Oh, I love <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Mostly like, pec tears. Like flew you guys in mm -hmm. just they, for that They knew that months in advance this was going to happen. They, they heard about the programming. They were like, you know what? We're going to Encinitas. Yeah. The world needs to know. Yeah. <laughs> and we predicted the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you, guys, uh, you guys created the Movement Fix, and it's... Uh, a great resource for people to go to to like if they're training and want to figure out well tell me what it is yeah well that's like, oh, tell everybody what it is you want to take that one ryan well I'm, i mean my, my i don't have anything to do with movementfix.com necessarily that's the brainchild of this gorgeous man over here oh, um <laughs> but yeah we collaborate on a, a, a little product together uh, but my main website is fitnesspainfree.com so check it out it's pretty sweet um but if you want to talk about movement fix go for it yeah, so the the movement fix is the uh, the website that I created. Essentially, the the educational brand, I guess you could call it. And what what we worked on was a uh, a project together on modifying workouts. So that's I guess you're in, you're involved. Thank in you. In that way, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a place where people can go to to learn about more than just stretching or mobilizing. But how do we bring a lot of pieces together from? accessory training and, and workout modification and mobilizations as well as rolling out and how does that fit together with training programs so it's really a place for athletes coaches trainers and a lot of clinicians to to um to learn yeah so. and one of the things we want to dig in today is how to how to select movements that are going to be safe when you're injured or not feeling great or even if even if you have a hit you may not be injured now but you know you have a history of you know i when I do this, I tend to get this. This tends to happen, and maybe you shouldn't be doing that ever because there's about a million things you could be doing, right? Um, can uh, Dan? We'll start with you. Can you fill us in on just like a quick bio why people should be uh, listening to your advice? Mm, okay. Well, sounds smart. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Dan, and uh, like I said, fitnesspainfree.com. I've been blogging for eight or nine years. I'm a physical therapist, um, strength conditioning coach. I've been doing strength conditioning full time before I became a physical therapist. And when I was doing personal training, strength conditioning, I just I really wanted to help people that were hurting, right? And I felt like I didn't have that information, so it drove me to go into physical therapy. And uh, the primary audience I work with is fitness, right? And I've been strength conditioning, like I said, for a while. I was CrossFit coaching for six or seven years. I've been to the CrossFit Regionals twice, so I'm a competitor with that stuff. And uh, I deal with mostly athletes and people who want to get better. So uh, that's my main gig. I do that every single day of the week. So that's, uh, that's me. It sounded smart. We did a good job. Really smart. Yeah. I'm impressed. <laughs> I like lamp. You what? I love lamp. Love lamp. <laughs> <laughs> What's that from? Uh... Anchorman? Anchorman. Yeah, yeah. Man, where you guys oh, at? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were on that quick. Okay, so so if someone, you know, training's really easy. If you don't have any pain whatsoever, like you just, you write, you write your workouts, you go in there, you do it, you get a good result. Like it's, it's not that difficult. What people run into trouble is that they, they end up getting hurt. They get aches and pains. Like they can't handle the volume. And then they, now they're, now they're going through kind of the roller coaster of like, I'm training really, really hard and then I get hurt and then I kind of have to back off and then I, I, I feel better. I train really hard. Now you're up and down, up and down, up and down. If, if training was linear, we'd all be amazing athletes, but unfortunately it's not linear. Five pounds a week forever. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not even close to linear. A lot of people, um, the injuries are really the things that, that hold them back. It's not necessarily a lack of motivation necessarily. Uh, maybe the e injury causes a lack of motivation, but motivation itself isn't really a problem. Injuries tend to be the things that really pull people away from really hitting their full potential. And so uh, there's there's two two parts to this. They can either either avoid the injuries before they occur by, by having 
adequate movement selection and volume programming, et cetera, or, and or after they get hurt, they need to know what to do to work around those injuries because inevitably almost everyone I know that is a, a competitor at, at any level, they're dinged up here and there all the time. It's not like, oh, I've been perfect and then I had an injury and I had to back off. It's like, no, 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 no. My elbow is always hurting. My wrist is always achy. I had shoulder surgery. My knee, my knees bugs me when I do too much of this, of this, you know, too many pistols or front squats or whatever it is. They're always working around something. And that's what you guys are experts at is how do you, how do you still, how do you still train effectively while you're hurt? You're not necessarily injured, but people are always hurt and they have injuries, which aren't necessarily the same thing. So to, today we want to talk about, you know, if you can't squat, if you can't deadlift, if you can't do cleans for the moment, how do you modify those things to where you can still get a really good training effect and not exacerbate any current injuries that you happen to have? There we go. I like that. So if we start with something basic like like squatting, like if you can't back squat and you love back squatting and you're great at it, like, but you're, now your knee hurts and now your back hurts or, or whatever, like what, what do you do? What are some modifications someone could do if they say, say we start with a back injury? You got back squats, you love back squatting, but your back hurts. What do you do? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so there's a couple of things I think about when people have low back pain. So some people just can't handle a lot of load, right? So some people just, when they pick up a bar out of the, uh, the rack, just the actual load press it down their spine. It's just a, a bit too much. They just they don't they don't handle that well, right? So if you think about a back squat translates to a front excuse me a front squat usually can't uh, it's a little less load to the spine they feel a little bit better, right? Uh, for something like people that can't handle shear, so when you bend forward, the more and more you bend forward, there's more shear force that goes across the spine. Uh, for people who can't handle that, if we just change the torso angle, a lot of times it helps a ton. So someone who can't back squat, maybe they can front squat a little bit better, mm-hmm. right? Um, the other piece is sometimes when people have low back pain, they don't handle the position of their spine, right? Uh, the very bottom of a squat or a deadlift there's always going to be some sort of lumbar flexion, which is not always a bad thing, but when you're in pain, sometimes your body can't handle that very well. So if you're taking a variation where you're going very deep and you get a little bit of flexion in the spine and it hurts a bunch, then we can very easily change that depth, right? Or we can try to do things like add a heel to an Olympic lifting shoe, so now your back's a little more neutral. Uh, We could pick a front squat or goblet squat, something that keeps you in a more neutral position. So like you said, if you have a low back injury, it's one of those things where you have to be careful not to continue aggravating that in order to get better, right? Hmm. Because a lot of getting better is just time and not irritating things. So if we can train for long enough and get a training effect and we're not irritating the back and we're training and we're working towards our goals, then that's a win because over time we're going to get less sensitive. We can we can go back to some of the things we weren't able to before and you're not going to be continually going up and down, riding this plateau back and forth. So... So for someone who's been doing this for a long time, it might sound really obvious that adding something like a weightlifting shoe that has an elevated heel might be easy, make it easier on your back. You know, but that's it's, you know you put you're changing your shoe and also your back feels better. That that might be counterintuitive to someone who doesn't have a lot of experience in this world. So why would something like that really make a difference? Yeah, so it's a little bit weird. So if you're going into a deep squat, right? Let's say we we want to hit depth, we want to go all the way down to the bottom of a deep squat, and uh, the areas that are really important for getting that are going to be the ankle, the knee, and the hip, right? So if we don't have mobility in one of those areas, then another area has to make up for it. And that's kind of the whole butt wing thing. So if you don't have mobility, it's ankle, it could be knee, it could be hip, then a lot of times low back will round more. So if you add more mobility to the system by adding a heel lift, then all of a sudden it's going to be easier for you to maintain a more neutral position of the spine. So if, if the lumbar flexion or that wink is what gives you pain, if we add a heel lift and make it easier to keep a neutral spine, then we have less pain because of that. Mm-hmm. Should we be, you know, should we be just moving to a weightlifting shoe or should a weightlifting shoe be something we want to move away from? Well, I think it depends. Over time. Yeah, I think it really depends on your goal. So if we're, if we're talking about CrossFit specifically, they're going to need to be able to train in a regular shoe. So it's one of those things. It's kind of like a crutch, right? So after you have a surgery, you have a crutch, you use it for a while, then you can progress to one crutch maybe, then you're off of crutches, right? So I think it's something that allows you to have pain-free motion for a bit. And then as this area of rehabs, if you work with someone who's giving you specific movements, specific manual techniques and make it better, then over time we want to get away from that shoe. But it might be a way for you to train pain-free and keep working on your goals um, in the meanwhile. So for that person, they in this example, they might not have adequate ankle range of motion. So you're kind of giving them like artificial ankle range of motion by giving them a little bit of a heel lift. Now they can push their knees a little bit further forward because they can push their knees further forward. They can get the hips more under them, gives them more vertical torso, and that takes the load off of their back because now they're not so bent over. You got it. More yep. or less. Yep. Um, so what, what are some other things? If you if you have back pain, are there any other things you can do besides having a, a different type of shoe and having more heel lift that can help take the stress off of your back for something like, like a back squat or, or other modified types of squatting? Yeah, and, and a lot of times this is it's not as nice as we're making it out to seem, right? So a lot of times people come to 
to us because pretty much everything hurts, right? So any type of loading for your low back generally doesn't feel good. Even something like a goblet squat, you know, to a box doesn't work out, you know. And if that's the case, a lot of times I like to try single-legged exercises. Uh, generally, your, your torso is much more upright. So, again, you don't have the same shear forces. Well, if you're using dumbbells and it's a single-legged exercise, you usually can't load it as much. So load's not that big of a deal, right? Plus, we're not getting into as much hip flexion. So we're not getting as much rounding the low back. It's just a friendly lift in general. So if we're still trying to get some sort of training effect for the lower body, for the lower legs, then it's, it's a great option, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so dumbbells, and a lot of times people can get away with doing a barbell loaded exercise uh, if it's a single leg as opposed to a squat. So mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to be a dumbbell, but single leg exercise in general, I, I talk about this all the time, but I think we need more of those in our program generally. If you're doing a lot of single leg stuff, say I'm experiencing some back pain or I'm avoiding back pain by going single leg squat, do I need to be doing additional lower back work? Because, I, I mean, your back's now not getting loaded. We're intentionally avoiding it. Yeah. And so I... Is there a possibility? It's like, oh, let's do a bunch of single leg work. Six months down the road, you start back squatting, get hurt again. Well, I think uh, it's you should probably be evaluating and figure out exactly what's going on because, like we said before, things like mobility limitations can lead to this. Maybe it's a core stability issue. Um, there's a lot of things that can lead to that. We always want to make sure we have a good ramp. So if you have low back pain, one of the first things you want to do is stay away from things that bug you for a little bit and then ramp back up again. A lot of times that's enough to get the majority of people better, right? Yep. The problem I see is that if you start doing a whole bunch of single-legged exercises, the back feels good. Now it's like, okay, great, five by five back squat. We get on a heavy bar 500. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're doing like six, <laughs> right back 700 to where you pounds. Were. Yeah, you get right back to where you were. So obviously you I'll need tell you to what, I've done, I've done a couple months of single leg work before and then hop back under a squat. Fuck, it feels heavy. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, but yeah, you just need to make sure you have a nice slow ramp period back up again, which could even be the course of uh, several months. I think some people, they just want to get back to training as fast as possible. You guys know this. It's Your body doesn't always behave the way everything else in life behaves. There's no easy button. It's not fast. It's not high-speed internet. It's slow, and you just have to be patient with it. So Yeah. Okay. Well, what, what if we transition away from the back for a second? What, what if your knees are bothering you during squats? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll direct this to you, Ryan, since yeah, sure. you haven't spoken as much yet. So Say something. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Dan was on I such know. a roll, I didn't want to interrupt that. Dan uh, keeps that, butting in. That thought process. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so if your knees hurt, what do you do? Yeah, so if your knees hurt, um, you know, the more vertical we can keep the shin in a squat, Typically, that makes people's knees feel better. So we'd be thinking, instead of doing something like a front squat or an overhead squat, where your knees have to come forward in order for your torso to stay vertical, then we might have to transfer to a box squat, a low bar back squat, um, or getting into back into the single leg, uh, like a rear foot elevated split squat. Hmm. So a lot of times, again, it's, it's that issue of re are you resting it or are you modifying it? And... Uh, it's not always such an easy thing. So I, just because we're not doing a front squat and letting the knees translate over doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be weaker. And um, But those would be the, main, the, the first ones that I'd go to. The other thing to think about for the knee is ankle mobility. If your ankles are stiff and they can't easily go into dorsiflexion, that can create a little bit more stress at the knee joint. So that might be another time where you think about lifting shoes um, or, a, or a heel lift of some sort to take stress off the knees. But I'd go right away um, to, to some sort of vertical shinned squat variation. Now, the problem you might run into with that is what if someone's kind of dealing with a back issue and their knees hurt? Because people are allowed to have more than one thing going on. No. Yeah, right? <laughs> it happens. The, the, the person's bill of rights, they're allowed more than <laughs> one painful area. So that, that's where I'd be thinking even more about something like a rear foot elevated split squat or maybe a sled drag or a sled pull mm -hmm. um, where they're not directly compressing their spine with a sled drag. And they're not going. Mm. They're not getting a huge knee stress like they would in a front squat. Um, and I think that it would also be to to speak to the back issue. Doing sled drags is a phenomenal way to train your legs without stressing your back. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned this firsthand. I had a, I had back pain for like 24 months when I came out of chiro, chiropractic school, and I couldn't do any weight, like spinal compression lifts, back squats, anything. So sled drags can be mm. the best training option for that person. Because you, you're getting incredible leg training, but literally because the strap is around your waist, if you did it that way, mm -hmm. there's no spine, there's very little spine load. Uh, so th yeah, so that, would, that could really be a good option for somebody if they're, you know, none of these things are uh, allowing them to train without pain in their back. Uh, what, what do you think about the knee? 
Yeah, so I think that shin angle is real important. And again, it, it really depends on what's going on inside your knee. I think uh, what the majority of people are dealing with is more of a, we call it patellofemoral pain syndrome, or just pain on the underneath, excuse me, under surface of the kneecap. And just a lot of that stress is probably irritating potentially the bone. There's a lot of structures in there that can get irritated. Uh, but what ends up happening is that the more your quad is active and the deeper you go into a squat, the more compression is on the under surface of the kneecap, right? So what ends up happening is we send the hips back a little further in a squat front squat, back squat, whatever that is, there's going to be a little less of the knee bend. And what ends up happening is there's less compression force. The quad is not as active, right? The deeper you go, the more compressive force you have. So automatically you can say, okay, I'm going to send the hips back a little further, have something that requires a little less knee bending or knee flexion. So something like a low bar back squat might be good. Um, what's a little tough is that we talk about this too. It's kind of like robbing Peter to pay Paul. And all you're doing is redistributing where the forces go, right? So if I'm in a back squat and I'm super upright, it's high bar back squat, that's going to be a little more stressful on my knees. If I send my hips back, less stress on knees, more stress is going to probably fall on the spine and there's probably more um, compression going on in the hips. So you just have to think about those variables when you're trying to help someone because we can easily make a, a tweak that might make them feel really good, but just keep in mind, you're, you're stressing something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I, I've had that experience uh, when I was competing in weightlifting and it, I don't, I wouldn't say I had too much of a movement flaw, but there were, there were points in the year where my knees were just aching. But my hips felt fine, my back felt fine, and then I would go to only doing pulls and doing uh, low bar box squats and just really letting that shin be nice and vertical. I gave my knees a break for maybe three months at a time. I mean, three months, I think I ended up finding out on average I needed three months out of the 12 of that type of training. My hips would get a lot stronger, and then next thing I know, I'm hitting PRs on my lifts. I was like, oh, I was actually distributing all the weight towards my quads, not enough to my rear, and now it's more even and I'm hitting bigger lifts. That's good. Yeah. yeah. That's that's enormous. I think it's important that people think about their training year um, mm -hmm. like that, you know, and like you had said, if you do too much of a given type of lift, your knees get achy. That makes sense, you know. I, I see a ton of this. People start like a small op program or hash, <laughs> right, and they're trying to Olympic lift on top of that. Everyone loves to variables. reference the small off squat program. It's good. I mean, I hate to say some of this stuff because it just seems like I'm a hater in general. Well, it's because everybody, everybody, like, sees it and wants to do it. Yeah. And then, oh, I got crazy yeah. results off of it. Yeah. And then yeah. you hear people come in, you know, from the same gym, and they're like, oh, my hips are getting pinchy in the yeah. front. Like everybody came from the same place. Yeah, yeah. they're, yeah. Like, they're like, man, we started small. <laughs> we started small. Up. And it's because they they had this volume that just went, Phew. Yeah. And now right. suddenly it's like, oh, I'm getting pinchy in the front of the hips, or I feel tight in the front of my hips. Yeah. Uh, which isn't always tightness. Is Oh, yeah. 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 Actually, I'd love for you to touch on that because, that, like, like you're saying right now, a lot of people have that, that yeah. issue and they don't know what to do about it. What do you, what do, you do if you feel that, that pinchy feeling in, in the front of your hips, you're, you're impinging or what have you? Yeah. Um, I feel like Quit. you should start with this one. Quit. <laughs> 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 so much. Ryan was kind of, kind of a pioneer with this. He uh, got a lot of hate mail for a while. Oh, I did get a lot of hate mail. You should definitely talk about that. About yeah. the hate mail or the reason? <laughs> no, the reason. Mail. So you <laughs> get more hate yeah. mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like, yeah. I mean, I don't like thrive it. off of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wrote I wrote this article probably like three or four years ago on my site called uh, "The Best Kept Secret: Why People Have to Squat Differently," and it was um, I really displayed these photos that showed differences in the femur and how it can be uh, t torsioned or retroverted or antiverted mm -hmm. based on how it's um, kind of twisted through the with the shaft of the femur, and then also the variation in the socket on the pelvis, and. Uh, it's incredible the differences there can be from people, even if you had a group, like let's say you had a group of 20 people in a class. In that group of 20, there will be differences. Um, and that kind of seems almost hard to believe at first. There's a lot of uh, kickback from this article, as I mentioned, and uh, people thinking that, you know, maybe it's not as common. But when you get, uh, when you go and evaluate lots of people's hips, it's incredible how much in a group of 20 there, there could be differences. Now, the implication of that is if you put someone in a toed forward or maybe only five degree toed out stance, that may lead them to run out of space in their hip joint mm. at 90 degrees or maybe even above 90 degrees for some people. And so if they're squatting that way, at first it's not going to get irritated. That would be like when I stand on my feet, I'm compressing my feet. It doesn't hurt right now because I haven't irritated it. Now if I go run a marathon and I suddenly increase the volume standing on my feet, which is something that shouldn't be painful is now painful because it's sensitive. So if you put someone in a non-optimal squat stance, they will close down their hip joint 
before it wasn't painful because it wasn't sensitive yet. They increased their volume, those tissues, whatever they were, um, and that would be speculative. The capsule, the tendon, maybe the actual bone, it becomes sensitive. So now they go into that same squat stance that suddenly it's like, oh, it feels tight in the front of my hip. Mm -hmm. And I want to stretch it because it, it feels tight. But I think that stretch sensation that we get, like, or the tightness sensation is, that's just what it feels like when that tissue is irritated from compressing it. Yeah. And so it's not a, it's not that the, the hip flexor needs to be stretched. Maybe we need to consider playing with your squat stance, either toe out a little bit more or take a wider or narrower stance to find the combination that allows you to squat pain-free. And, uh, I've heard some really great weightlifting coaches, their cue, their cue for squatting is just, just find the one that's comfortable. Like, and that's it. Can't and go I, wrong with that. And I think that, it, is that bad? You I mean, know, I mean, yeah. I, not everyone's going to fit in this in the same, have to be, you know, this many inches apart and this degree toe out no matter what. Right, right. Because there's so many variables. People who have long femurs, when you have a long femur, y you're weight is going to be shifted farther back when you squat and you will have to have more ankle range of motion to make up for that or you'll have to go in a wider or more toed out stance to make up for it so when you start thinking about all the combinations there are in, in the uh, the length of levers hip joint architecture it just isn't so easy to say just do it this way but that is one of the first things i would look at for pinching in the front of the hips let's evaluate the stance and i know you're big too on evaluating like the tilt of the of the pelvis maybe you could speak on that you got it so i guess uh biomechanically what we what we think is going on is that when you're going deeper into a squat you run out a range of motion within the hip and then you end up having some pinching of the ball up against the socket right and that pinching in the front is not tightness it's end range of motion and then maybe you're a little stiff in the back side hip or something the ball is not able to translate posteriorly or something along those along those lines but what we do know is a lot of times those issues are actually bony in nature so it's a bone problem and you can't stretch through that so i think people need to think about that in general because it might just be injuring their hips because they don't have optimal hips to squat with toes straight ahead um, like Ryan's saying, we can change the depth pretty easily and keep that from occurring. We can also go a little more toe out, a little external rotated. Um, what happens is that maybe we'll bring some of that bony deformity out of the way so that when you go deep into a squat, we're not getting that pinching anymore. Uh, the other thing to think about, and this is a little bit, um, it's a little tough to understand, but so you have a ball and socket joint in your hip. So the socket portion is part of your pelvis right? The femur is the ball. And one of the things we can do is that we can go deep into a squat and we can maybe change your stance a little bit to uh, reduce some of the ball coming up into the socket. We can also um, change the orientation of the socket a little bit. So one of the things I think is getting more popular now is people are starting to learn about overextension of the lumbar spine or just mm -hmm. doing too much of this, too much an anterior pelvic tilt. So if we get someone and we put them in a more neutral position, what's happening is you're taking the socket and you're bringing it away from the ball, right? So if I'm going deep into a squat and I'm the person I'm really you know aggressively trying to pursue this extended position that I'm bringing that socket down into the ball and I'm creating the same exact problem so one of the things we can do is we can mess around a little bit with that right um, so kind of going back to the way you can modify it, if you have an individual that has pain in the hip we want to try to modify those variables so we want to try to get the stance taken um, taken care of right a little more toe out um, a little bit wider more narrow whatever it is we also want to fix the hip position right because that's important but if you think about something like a back squat when I'm doing a back squat it's going to incline my torso forward and that's essentially bringing the socket down into the ball right so what you'll find a lot of times is folks is like you know I, I first and this is what I have this happened to my hip is my hips first started hurting doing back squats because it's just a little bit more of a forward torso inclination you're bringing the socket more into uh, the ball it requires more hip flexion than something like a front squat but lo and behold if I go front squat it wasn't hurting my hip at all and we think it's probably because there's a variety of reasons why it could happen but uh, we think is that what we're doing is we're just taking the socket away from the ball a little bit so when people squat they're a little more upright it requires less hip flexion and they end up feeling a little bit better because of doing that right yeah so Along with that, if you're getting a little bit more um, posterior tilt, as, as in you're not anteriorly tilting, you're bringing yourself back into a neutral position, mm -hmm. to, which, which requires you to posteriorly tilt back to normal, right? To, to do that, you can, as a part of that, you're getting a little more glute activation, and then by getting a more glute max activation, you're, the fact that your glute max is contracting, it's pulling the head of your humerus back a little bit where you're not getting that anterior anterior 
femoral glide. Yeah. So you're not pinching into the front of your hip because your glute is working. If your glute's not working, then you're more likely to impinge in that way. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a good question, right? Um, so I was talking to a guy by the name of Mike Voigt. He's just a really prominent physical therapist with the SFMA guys. If you guys familiar with like Greg Cook and those guys, he works with a surgeon named uh, Dr. Bird, right? Who does a ton of hip surgeries. He's a really good hip surgeon. And one of the things they're talking about is that how much does that ball really move in the socket, right? So the thing about the ball and socket joining the hip is it's it's got a deep socket and the ball fits right in it. The shoulder is kind of like for the golf ball on a, on a tee analogy. It moves quite a bit. Um, we think that the same thing is probably happening in the hip. But the other thing is that how much motion is really occurring in the hip, right? So one of the thoughts that goes through my head is like, yeah, if we get the glutes to fire a little bit better, maybe we're getting a little bit better posterior glide. You know, that might be happening. The other piece is that how much motion is really occurring. And what ended up happening was Mike was trying to do um, some joint glides to an individual while they're under anesthesia, right? So mm. um, in the surgery room. And they weren't getting much motion, right? They weren't getting any glide of the joint necessarily. So um, not really sure if that's occurring or not. But it's a good idea. It's just that I just I don't necessarily know if that's going to fix people um, by trying to apply those rules. I'll still try it, um, but I think it's more of a positional problem than it is a muscle activation problem, I guess. Mm-hmm. Makes so sense. My, my understanding with that is it wasn't necessarily like the, the, the ball was sliding around in the hip. It's that if it's, if it's facing like this, it's it's rolling like that and pinching with kind of the neck of the femur. Is that is that not accurate? Um, I guess I'd, I'd have to kind of think about that a little bit. Um, but in general, I think what ends up happening is people are getting some pinching on the, the front tops of their hips, right? Mm-hmm. So right where the ball goes into the socket right there, not necessarily as much on like the neck area, but more right on the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and then people that have, it's called a cam deformity, they have a, an extra little chunk of bone that's on the femoral head, mm-hmm. and that's probably going right up against the socket there. So, so like where the ball where the ball meets the neck? Yeah, it's kind of like a little extra ridge kind of thing in that area. Gotcha. Yeah, kind of like a camshaft, I guess, is what they named it after. Okay. Uh, to to rewind just a second to back what you're saying about antiversion and retroversion, most people probably don't know what that, what that really means. Yeah. Um, so to rewind even further, a friend of mine, you know, he used to squat, you know, like kind of like not really narrow stance, just kind of shoulder width apart, and he was towed out a little bit. He did that for a long time, and he felt great. And then someone got a hold of him and said, no, 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 you need to like be narrow, and you have your feet straight ahead. And then then once he did that for a while, once he was doing it quote unquote correctly, then he started having a bunch of problems. He was like, I never squatting never bothered me until I fixed it and started doing it right you know that doesn't make any sense to me and I was like well you know, how'd you do it before and you know watching him do it the way that he was taught to do it versus the way that he used to do it I was like well actually it looks, it looks better to me the way you used to do it and he said it feels better it's like just go back the way you're, that you used to do. there's no way you have to do it and then we, we kind of had that conversation about well like you might not actually be in a neutral hip position with your toes straight ahead like you would you would think so uh, can you just kind of explain what antiversion retroversion is and how that might affect somebody when squatting with just a little more detail and some practical examples yeah so if you think about let's let's say this is the top of my knee so from here to here is my femur so it be like this okay through the middle of the bone it can literally be twisted so if this was the if this was the ball of the femur it could be like this and or it could be like this and anywhere in between so in in all whether this is a person, this is a person, this is a person, their knees are pointed in the same direction. But as you said, they're not in the best hip position to go into flexion, which would be what we need for a squat. So if somebody's towed forward, they go like this and they run out of space. Now another person, they're twisted, which would be torsion or version of the femur, and they can easily go like that. And it's because the middle of the bone is twisted. Mm -hmm. So certain lifts, I think, can be taught a little bit more standardized than others. For example, if you're doing a push press or a push jerk, you could say, go toad forward, feet under your hips, and go dip and drive because you're not going through enough hip flexion for it to matter. But when you're thinking about bottoming out a squat, the position of the hip, it matters more because you get to the end range of motion and it's not just a, it's not a hinge. It's, it's shaped differently. Mm. So that's when you might, that's when you'd have to be a, more okay with one athlete doing it differently than, than the other. Do you see yeah. a difference between legs on the same athlete at times? I do. And that, uh, and I think that, uh, <coughs> I don't know of any research on this, but w- w- there is a lot on the shoulder for, for throwers where their throwing arm Yep. Is, is twisted, so that would be humeral. The, the actual bone. The actual is, bone has experienced some, yeah, some it, twist. It's it's twisted through the shaft, and um, per, but, like, but I th- semi permanent. I mean, you could say it's permanent, and you're not gonna. Yeah. Most people aren't gonna go through whatever it takes to reverse that. But once it's done, it's done. So my theory is this: if I was 
going to try to untwist my femur. I would have to repetitively mobilize my hip or or twist it internally or externally. Mm. But I think I would I think I would create Welcome a, to my Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think what would happen though if you were to play this out, I think you would end up having a bony impingement in your hip joint before you would get the femur to untwist. I don't know that that mm. would be really be possible. It'd be like, can I press on my cheekbone and get it to change shape over time? I don't know that, that that's possible. <laughs> Sounds like a long process. Yeah, but I think you'd end up it's with It's all a about hip. commitment. It's kind of like having braces. You've got to have committed. those things in there pulling on stuff for, for, I don't know how long, but years before you make like any noticeable real change. Yeah, so, yeah that's but, a good but, example. But all, all that to say that like for any, any person that just stands here, you know, feet hip width apart, toes straight ahead, you might not be in a neutral hip. That's right. right. That's you, right. You might be in a neutral hip with your toes pointing towards each other, or you might be in a neutral hip with your toes pointed out. Like you don't need yeah. necessarily know unless you have somebody test to see if you're antiverted or retroverted. That's so, right. so if you are someone who, you know, you you're towed out and you squat and you feel totally great, well, maybe you just have a slightly different hip shape than someone else that That's does right. toes straight ahead. And all the stuff you said earlier about long torso, short femurs, and and all that definitely apply here. Like it's easier to squat to full depth with a long torso and and short legs with toes straight ahead That's than right. it is if you have long femurs but it might also be the shape of your yeah. hip. Yeah, and I think to speak to your point too, so think about this. If I went feet forward and knees out like this, for another athlete who has a different hip, that to create the you know that torque that they want, they would have to literally go like this and do that. Mm -hmm. And no one's coaching that. Yeah, no, no one's coaching. No, one, no, no one's, one's coaching, co toes no one's in. coaching that. But that could be essentially the same toes hip in. position for somebody. If I was retro, no coach will do it because I, I, I would. Yeah, uh, don't do that. I, I'm I, not I, saying do no, that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying like, it's like I have an athlete. I teach them that, and then they go out in the world. Yeah. It's like no, who, who yeah. taught you that, Mike Bledsoe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You're not gonna be able to. They're not gonna be able to explain why they're doing it. It might yeah. be very specific to them, and right. then they say, "Oh yeah, he told me to do this," and the people are like, "Oh, that dude doesn't know what he's talking about." Right. That happens in coaching a lot. One coach is like, "Why the fuck are you doing it like that?" And it's like. The inexperienced coach thinks everyone else is an asshole. Yeah, and I think what you something you mentioned earlier that's interesting is the the squat looks better to me. So I guess we should talk about what what's a what should we look for to know that that is a squat we would want. That's a great topic. Let's hear it. And uh, so I think we should take a break. It's a good hook. That's a good hook. We'll hit it when we get back. <laughs> All right. Hey everybody, Marcus Gersey, co-host of the Barbell Business Podcast. If you're a gym owner who's looking to fix, build, or just take your gym from good to great, tune in every Tuesday to the Barbell Business Podcast. You can find us on iTunes and anywhere else you can download a podcast, or you can watch the video version on YouTube on the Barbell Shrugged channel. Tune in to find Doug, myself, and Mike Bledsoe talking about the latest tips and tricks to take your business to the next level. We'll see you Tuesday. And we're back with Dan Pope and Ryan DeBell, and uh, we were about to talk about how, what does a good squat look like? Mm -hmm. We all know what bad squats look like. We see it. We criticize. We hate. Hate. It's like porn. You yeah. Know, you know it when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> Even if there's no solid definition for it. Right, right. Yeah. But, you know, we've all been on Instagram. We've seen it. But uh, what, what's a good one look like? <laughs> you want to start there? <laughs> yeah. Big Ryan. I <laughs> Yeah, I look. I look. No for, pressure. Yeah, I don't feel pressure. That's good. I feel. I, I look for a couple of things. I look for, uh, what is the, what is the position of the low back in terms of, is it, held in neutral? Is it really rounded? So ideally, we want to hold it in neutral. Uh, what about? Uh, I've seen people be very hyperextended. Yeah, I don't want that either. That can lead to what would be called extension based back pain if you're ex if you're arching really hard in your squats and your deadlifts and you're doing a lot of overhead lifting and arching back th that can become sensitive you're just loading different joints when you do that so yeah i'm looking for both are you too rounded or are you too arched and uh, to know if somebody's too arched you really have to evaluate them doing something like a cat cow you know, like the mm. like the yoga pose where you watch them go into full flexion and full extension to get an idea of what, what is their spine capable of. Because people's spines can do different things uh, in terms of how far. Someone else, someone may look extended and that's their, that's close to neutral for them. Yeah. So that's one thing I'm looking for. The other thing I'm looking for is where is the knee pointing in relation to the foot? So ideally it would be over the middle to kind of the outside of the foot. And, uh, and then I want to make sure the heel stays flat on the ground. So if I see those three things and you know, I mean, there could be like a thousand other things, right? Sure. Like 
obviously I don't want someone tilting their head. So anyways, a million other things could be, you know, going on, but those are the main ones I'm looking for. And then if somebody has to be a little bit more, uh, a little wider with their stance or more towed out, and that allows them to meet those the back position knee knee to foot orientation and heel and uh, feet staying flat. I think that's what makes it look better. Mm-hmm. And also, there's there's probably some. It's almost hard to describe like the smoothness of the lift and the ease. Mm. Uh, like if someone's feet, if someone's too narrow, it maybe they go onto the outside of their foot and their foot rolls up. Yeah. And when I see that, I go, I kind of think that means just point your foot out a little bit, and then suddenly it just stays planted, and it looks smoother and it looks better. Mm. Uh, what? Do you have any other? Um, what, I think it's. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, what looks good to Dan Pope? That's what oh I was boy, say. it's really important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it really depends on someone's goals, right? I mean, we tend to work with a lot of Olympic weightlifters, so in Olympic weightlifting, you want to really kind of upright torso, which is really important. Uh, we talk to Chad Vaughn a lot. Chad Vaughn, two-time Olympian, he's a power monkey guy. Um, he likes to have a, just a little bit of toe out. He doesn't like to have a bunch of toe out, and one of his reasons being is he thinks you're stronger, more powerful for the receiving position of like a, a snatch or a clean because of that, which makes sense. It doesn't mean everyone gets into that position, you know, uh, but in general, if you're if you're trying to get in a good position for Olympic weightlifting, the torso is very important. So just making sure you're getting adequate motion from the ankle, staying upright. So if someone's really inclined forward, they're never going to be able to snatch well. So that's a big thing. That kind of takes us back to our goals. You know, someone who just wants to squat for fitness doesn't doesn't really matter that much. You know, you never need to hit depth. You know, there's never a reason necessarily to get super deep. I mean, getting deep is going to do a, a variety of things for you. But if your goals are just to get a bit stronger and work on your legs. You know, you may not need to ever hit that really deep position. You may not need a super upright torso. Um, so, again, I, I kind of like uh, Ryan's definition. It's There's going to be a lot of um, uh, variance in what works well. But in general, we want a flat back, right? We're going to get some flexion in the bottom. Can't control that. That's okay. Uh, we want to make sure the knees are over the toes, right? Um, I don't have a great number for you as far as a torso inclination, but you definitely don't want to see someone so far bent forward that you could eat, like, you know, lunch off their back in the bottom of their squat because they're so far forward. Good it's morning. A good thing. The good morning squat. Yeah, yeah we don't want to see that. Um, and then also on the way up, we want to make sure that, that mechanically things stay good too, right? So you were talking about when we come out of the bottom of the hole, a lot of times the knees come in, which is not necessarily ideal. Um, we think that's happening. I think this happens potentially because your body's trying to find a, a stronger position, right? So maybe it's, it's getting those added to fire a little bit harder. Maybe you're getting a, a twist or a stretch on the knee and some of the passive structures, maybe the ligaments or the outside of the knee is getting compressed and that gives you a little more strength to get out of the hole, right? Um, but it's probably not ideal from a health pr- perspective, right? Um, the bottom of the squat, a lot of times you see people whose hips rise too quickly, right? Kind of that stripper squat, which is not a, a good thing. You want to see things riding, rising smoothly. There's one place for the stripper squat yeah. and that's at the club. <laughs> there Keep it there. And there's yeah. definitely a good thing, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's Sorry. good form. I yell. That's good form. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> no. um, so this is all by context and goals. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Okay, so so I agree with what you're saying, yeah. Ryan, about you know neutral spine, heels on heels on the ground, yeah. uh, knees over toes. Like if you have those three things done well and they're done right, then it doesn't really necessarily matter like where your feet are or <clears throat> or how how toed out you are, um, especially with the context of that, like what you said a second ago. Um, there's no depth you have to hit. You're going more or less as low as you can with those three things in mind. So if you can only go to parallel with a neutral spine, heels on the ground, and knees over your toes, then then that's all the farther you need to go. If, you, if it's going below that, now all of a sudden your knees are, are caving in, or your heels are coming off, up off the ground, or you're going into lumbar flexion, then, well, now you just cut it off at that depth and come back up before those problems occur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, and then special consideration to certain performance uh, circumstances. Um, yeah. it, the, it, the stance may matter a little bit more there. Um, but, yeah. And then, you know, if you th- squatting with a bar on your back is a relatively new thing in terms of the human. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know? Actually, I, I don't remember where I saw it. I was, uh, I saw someone having a conversation online. It was like, the, humans have been squatting uh, since like the beginning of time. And, you know, this whole loaded squat, uh, put, and then being in a certain position, like if you look at people that are squatting around a fire, it's not the same squat that's happening in a gym. Yeah, they're not. They're not. You know, they're not keeping their back flat. They don't need to because the loads aren't so high. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you think about it before, I don't know how we want to get here, but if you think about Go it, for before, it. Before, <laughs> Go mod- for it. before modern exercise, right? If and when when people just they did stuff. I have to move this from here to here. Yeah. It was a lot more. You know, pick something up once and then carry it. You wouldn't stand like, oh, I need to move this rock over there. Let me do 10 reps and then, you know, move it over there. Or let me put it on my back and then, you know, squat it down. It'd be 
it would be almost like you're doing single deadlifts and carries more than anything else and and you know hanging from things and climbing would yeah, be th- I mean this is something I've been in consideration a lot recently and, and I've actually been doing more just hanging yeah. from things for training which I didn't do back when I was doing CrossFit mm-hmm. you know all the time you know now I'm just doing things that aren't necessarily competitive in nature like hanging from a bar and then the other thing I know I've actually been thinking about lately too is I just, I've never done a lot of carrying unless you're a strongman competitor yeah you're not and I've noticed that when I have done carries in my training I got fucking strong like th- th- my entire body just felt like it could do more yeah I bet or like grabbing onto something and walking backwards and dragging it yeah. Oh, talk about like getting back to the squatting thing. If you wanted to, if your knees were bugging you because uh, the the pressure on the kneecap, and, and so you wanted to not go as quad dominant, you could do a lower bar back squat and then do some backwards walking sled drags. That'll blow up your quads and it'll make your knees not hurt during the during the squat. I mean, granted, that's pain free because you're not bending your knee, so you're not having to kind of take it around the corner of your knee, which is going to change how the, the knee is loaded and the pressure and stuff. So That's a good point. I mean, there's a lot of ways to make your legs really strong, a lot of work you can do that doesn't mean that you stand in a rack with a bar on your back yeah, and, and go up and down. And I think the more that we can vary the things that we do, the better. So, you know, is, is modifying a workout bad? Is it good? Or is it just the training options and, and constantly changing things? Like, for example, like what you said, when, when you changed your programming, from you know being dominated by this kind of thing, and then you changed it to more hip dominant or yeah. uh, pole dominant. And what you mentioned too, think about your training for the year, going through these cycles where you're focusing on on this kind of training, and then this kind of training, and this kind of training. And you're constantly changing how your body is stressed. I think that's the best way to stay long term healthy and strong, and not get injuries. Yeah, is uh, don't overload it the same way all the time for years and years and years and years. Yeah, there's one there's one thing I want to touch on in regard to the squat, and, um, and that is the speed at which people are bouncing out of the bottom. And so, you know, coming from weightlifting, the idea is, you know, for me, it was like, if you can catch that bounce, good on you. Catch that bounce on that clean or even that snatch if you're that good, and then come out of the bottom and, and ride it up. Um, at, and what I found over time is in training for a sport like weightlifting, you don't even you don't want to do that all the time. But then I look at a CrossFit class where it's a bunch of people who are doing general fitness, not necessarily competing in anything. And you know, I watch them drop to the bottom of the squat and bounce out of the bottom. And what I what I witness a lot as well is they're not even staying tight through their core while they're doing that. So that's, all, that's another layer. Any thoughts on that or things you guys have seen? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at, and this isn't weightlifters, right? This is not necessarily in the general fitness population, but where a lot of uh, Olympic lifting injuries occur is out of the hole. So catching something really heavy like that bounce, right? And that may help you lift more weight, but the thought is that might be opening you up to some more injury, right? And I thought about this a lot when I was trying to research, like, is, is squatting safe? Is a deep squat safe? Is it really going to bother your knees if you go too deep? And I, I really couldn't find a lot of evidence that was either really pro or con, right? So it's a little bit tough. As you go down to a squat, different parts of the knee joint are stressed, like different part of the meniscus, wherever else you have different contact with different areas of the bone as you go down. And the very bottom is where most Olympic, excuse me, weightlifters get hurt. So it makes sense that you have to make sure that area is really strong and prepared if you're going to go down there, you know. So for the general fitness population, if they're going to be doing rock bottom cleans and snatches, they probably need to squat at rock bottom, you know, because yeah. otherwise they're going to open themselves up to, to have some injury, right? Do they need to do that? I, I don't know. You know, it's it's it seems like CrossFit is generally pretty safe in comparison to other sports, right? With the literature that's coming out. Again, there's a lot of variation on who's writing the programming, the coaching, all that stuff is super important. Um, so it's just a matter of whether or not you actually want to go down to that bottom position. Is that going to leave you more open to having knee injuries? I'd say probably yes. You know, do you need to go down there? No. If you substitute with a different movement, are you more at risk um, from getting hurt from a different movement than with deep squats? Maybe, maybe not, you know? So I would say for the general fitness population, you probably don't need or want to do that bounce in the bottom, right? If it's causing problems with elite level lifters that have prepared this this area for years and years and years, and it's still causing issues. And I would say you probably don't want to do it from a fitness perspective either. Uh, but I don't want to vilify squats and cleaning um, in the process of saying that, you know? Yeah. Having the experience I have up to this point, 
I, I like to have, if, if I'm going to train for that super deep squat, doing a lot of pause squats at the very bottom, spending some time there, doing a lot of slow eccentrics all the way to the bottom, staying tight throughout the entire time. Um, I've witnessed people, all, and I've done it myself, is, uh, I'm, I'm guilty of doing a pause squat and letting myself relax down there. And it's almost like a bone on bone type deal instead of letting the muscular chip musculature take care of the work mm -hmm. and so spending time tight at the bottom of a squat can really prepare you to to not get injured when you're bouncing out of the bottom yeah for sure one other thing that i like that a lot of people don't do that i really enjoy is doing um tempo one and a quarter squats <clears throat> oh yeah a little six i'm all kind of raspy but uh, so you squat all the way down enough with the excuses tempo. dog <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sick um so you, st you squat all the way down and then you come up to like parallel and then you go back down, and then you come back up. And I feel like for people that aren't very comfortable in that bottom position, oh, um, yeah. going down all the way, come up a little bit, and then going back down into that hole, they just spend more time in, in that bottom position. They get a lot more comfortable with it, and then they get further adaptations specifically in, in that bottom position. So if you've never done one and a quarter squats, I highly recommend you try them out. So much fun. Oh, so much fun. <clears throat> They're not fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's also an issue with only ever doing workouts that are timed because you're incentivized to not do eccentrics. Right. Like it's to your uh, benefit totally. to avoid the eccentric phase. So then you're all you're only ever training the concentric. I mean I mean an isometric in certain places, like in a deadlift, your back sure. is essentially an isometric. Sure. But if you are never training tempo or pause or one and a quarter squats and you're only doing these bouncing out of the bottom, out of the hole, you're missing a huge component of training. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think there's you know, there's a huge place for making sure that some of those things aren't always done for time because, again, the incentive is there to let's avoid the eccentric phase so we can get down through the rep faster. Yeah, intentional strength, skill, and or positional work is highly valuable. If you just met Con all the time, then, yeah, you're really, you're really missing a, a few key aspects of training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You cool. probably notice your your times improve if you if you have not been doing eccentrics and static holds. If you throw that in, uh, you'll probably see a, a huge leap in, in strength. Uh, the older I get, the more my training is eccentric and static holds and less concentric even. Mm. So I would say it, it, at least, I would say my concentric loading is like a third <laughs> of uh, total training at this point. All right, cool. So we, we covered squatting uh, in some detail. Let's move on to a new movement and kind of apply these same concepts so people can get a perspective on the same concepts but on mm. two, two separate um, motor patterns. So we, we, we covered squatting. Now if we look at hinging with something like deadlifts, you know, let's go through the same phase. Like if you have back pain with a deadlift or if you have knee pain with a deadlift, like how do you modify deadlifts where you can still get a good training effect but you don't exacerbate your back and or your knee pain? So starting with back pain, what are your thoughts, Dan? All right, so my back hurts and then deadlifts are popping up today. Um, I guess we'll start with the problem. In general, what ends up happening is people try to do that lift, they get frustrated, they get hurt more, and then they can't continue on with the goals, right? So obviously we want to make that modification. Uh, for a coach, you got to make sure you ask if anyone's hurting before the class starts because a lot of times athletes are not going to communicate that. So make sure you establish that relationship and athletes feel like they're comfortable saying this. Um, but let's say I have low back pain and we'll go through kind of the same process. So let's say that the more I bend forward this way, the more my back tends to hurt. So the more shear in my spine, so my vertebrae are actively doing this, I guess, and the muscles are trying to keep my back from doing that. It tends to hurt me more and more. And you'll get a flavor of this based on how the the uh, the, the athlete is behaving, right? So they say something like a deadlift really hurts, back squat hurts, um, and then a front squat feels good. You're like, okay, well, it seems like that position of your torso has to do um, with some of that problem. So a couple things we can do. For one, for that same athlete, we want to be a little more upright. So there's a, a few different exercises. I'm a big fan of like a trap bar deadlift, if you guys have seen those before. So what happens in a trap bar is that you're able to be a little more upright. So you're still loading the spine, but it's just not the same position, right? Uh, the other thing is that if we elevate the... Uh, the apparatus, so if it's like a high handle trap bar, um, or you just don't go down quite as deep. So the, the further I go down, the more shear my spine is exposed to. So what I can do is go for a trap bar, go a little bit higher, and I can probably get away with, with not hurting my back as much as I would um, with a heavier load. Um, the other thing we didn't talk about yet, but I think it's really important, is it kind of segues into the whole tempo um, eccentric that we were talking about before. So let's say it's just a matter of load. Load hurts, right? I did this the other day with, I was supposed to do like a, a heavy set of three on a close grip in 
incline press. My shoulder was just killing me, right? So I moved over some dumbbells and I just lightened the load and I just did a tempo for sets of 15. So two things happened there. One, the load is decreased so it doesn't really hurt, right? Two, I raised the repetitions so I can't do as much weight. And three, I added a tempo so now I can't use as much load at all, right? So if I have someone who has a little back pain, I might not be able to trap bar deadlift, but hey, let's lighten the load and let's try to add um, an eccentric pause, like a, or a three second lower or something along those lines. So that way that person is getting a, a nice train effect. They're, they're working very hard, but they're not ex- uh, experiencing that same pain. So that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you said very similar things about, about squatting. There's, there's ways you can modify the movement where you can use less weight, but still get a good training effect. And so by doing higher repetitions, by, by changing your, your torso angle, by, by selecting a movement that's similar, but not the exact same, you can still get a lot of progress. You got have, have, have good results from your training without hurting your back. You got it. Yep. Be yep. fine with the longer eccentrics. People end up moving more efficiently or maybe not efficiently, but better. Well, I find, especially with, like we were talking about with squatting, I love tempo work. I love Paul's work. I love the one and a quarter stuff. I think it's awesome. Uh, what it forces people to do is to think about their position a little bit more, right? You're going down in this position. you got to hang out there for a little bit. On the way down, you can think about your positions a little bit better. If we're talking about spinal position, some people overextend. A tempo is awesome because you have to think about where you're at the entire time as opposed to dropping down and being really concerned about getting back up again. So yep. load's not as heavy. Uh, we're more focused on skill and position work, and then we're also getting a training effect. And, and if load is the real problem the reason why you end up having pain it's a solution right yeah and if you're <clears throat> if you're an advanced athlete you might not be um, gaining much got much ground as far as strength goes if you, if you already squat 530 you're not going to be like making a lot of progress on your one rep max by doing sets of 15 out of tempo you know maybe moving over to single leg work yeah that's true but in, in this example you might be limiting the amount of of loss you know you're not you're not going from 530 to 500 to 470 to 450 maybe yeah. maybe you lose 30 pounds on, on your back squat and then once your back is healed then you, you can ramp back up um, a little bit easier because you didn't lose so much ground so exactly. you know that's not ideal deal necessarily but that that's the reality of, of of having an injury is that yeah you might lose some some one rep strength like your the, the, the hardest contraction you possibly could do in a competition setting might go down but maybe not as much because you did something rather than nothing or you push it which is what most people tend to do and then get hurt more and then their weights start going down because it's so painful and that's yeah. the slippery slope that i think a lot of athletes go down is that they feel the need they really have to train i mean this is like a one week thing right i go in the gym next week i'm like oh i can do three reps again and then chances are my strength didn't go down very much but if i try to really push that there's a chance it'd be even even worse i'm like oh it's hurting even worse you know then i have to make another decision do i want to try to press again right because that didn't work out last time <laughs> or do i want to try to modify again and maybe like you said i'll lose a, a little bit of strength but in general i'll maintain you know and i'm also doing things like building more muscle mass there's a couple of good things that go along with with adapting a, a tempo you know so mm-hmm. you're you're progressing in that session um and you're not uh, losing i guess potentially right yeah i feel like a lot of people they will just push through it they'll, they'll, they'll keep squatting or they'll keep benching or they'll keep doing whatever they need to do and then they'll have a surgery and then they get, take a lot of time off and they try to come back. And then now the second time around, they're like, oh, okay, like my, my, my shoulder's really hurting. Maybe I will try this like five sets of 12 at a tempo, you know, with dumbbells instead for a little while. That way I don't have to have surgery again because they learned the lesson the hard way the first time. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of times injuries are, uh, they're the best teacher. You know, it forces you to really pay more attention to these things. So it's just unfortunate that it has to always get to that point before yeah. we start going, okay, let me reconsider, is this the best decision right now with based on how things are feeling? Um, I think to add to what you're mentioning about the deadlift, so we can consider overall compression of the spine, which would be, you know, what's the load? What's the weight that we're doing? We can think about the angle of the torso, so how much shear are we having to control? And then the other thing to think about too is, and that this relates to the trap bar as well, is what's the, what's the lever arm, like how far in front of me is the weight? Oh, so yeah. one of the things that's nice about a trap bar, uh, and they measure this with force plates and stuff, is which joints are contributing to me lifting that weight. So when you do a trap bar, you're getting more distribution in the ankles, knees, hips, and back versus a um, just a con- like a standard bar. Mm-hmm. Um, and the re- one of the reasons they designed the trap bar was to bring the weight so that you're literally standing inside of the bar. So it's not in front of you like a conventional bar. And so that's why sometimes, too, that can be helpful. Now, if you didn't have a trap bar... You know, doing something like a dumbbell Romanian deadlift or, or dumbbell deadlift or kettlebell where you can keep the weight even closer to your body. That decreases the lever or the, the uh, lever arm on your back, and that could be another consideration. 
as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, t to talk on the eccentric thing, I think a lot of times athletes will feel, depending on obviously their experience level, when they get down into a deadlift, as soon as they feel hamstring tension, they're like, oh, I got to bend my knees. I got to, mm. I shouldn't feel that. So I think going slow and doing a Romanian deadlifts or single leg, uh, either single leg double arm or single leg single arm deadlifts teaches people how to feel their hamstrings load uh, without always just coming right off that by bending their knees, tap the weight and come back up. So there's definitely different things being trained there muscularly as well as the, the timing. Yeah. Also, if you have an asymmetry and you've never done single arm, single leg RDLs, yeah. uh, you should try it out because you'll you'll probably very quickly realize that you do not do it symmetrically on on both sides. Not not strength wise, not movement wise either. Like yeah. you, you might look completely different. One leg you might feel really comfortable. The other leg you might feel like you just you can't keep your balance the whole time, and that and that's a problem. And that's likely one of the things that's contributing to the fact that you're hurt in the first place. Yeah, and it, you know, and if just if doing symmetrical lifts like a, a standard barbell deadlift was going to get rid of that, it would be gone. If you've been training that for any length of time, but most people, when they start testing this, as you mentioned, it, it is different side to side. The other thing you're getting too, when you go, um, single leg deadlifting is you're getting essentially half the load of the spine for the same leg training. And this is true for the split squat as well. Like if I was going to be deadlifting, let's say 200 pounds, I have to hold a bar that's 200 pounds that goes through my spine and then into 100 pounds each leg if I'm perfectly symmetrical. If I go 50 pounds in each hand, now that's 50 pounds through the spine, or 100 pounds through the spine, and then 100 pounds per leg. So you're getting twice as much leg training for it. So you could think about almost like leg to spine ratio of loading. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're also having to worry about uh, the core is now having to stabilize against yeah. rotation. Right. Which... If you're you know, not trained for that, and, it's an issue. And the most strength sports, it's very sagittal plane. We're not working with a lot of rotation. And adding this in for assistance work or during warm-ups can be fantastic for preventing injuries. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many stories I've had of people who are like, yeah, I snatched uh, you know, 245 at the gym, and then I went and played flag football, and I twisted my ankle. And yeah. It's like, yeah. Tore my hamstring. Cause, yeah, because you're never training the, the rotation, uh, single leg work. So yeah, yeah. how many of those injuries are not happening in the gym? Um, because of things that we aren't doing in the gym to, to help translate yeah. over. Mm -hmm. I've been training a lot more rotation the last year or two, and it's interesting that just when I feel like, I'm like, oh, I you know, I think I got this rotation thing figured out, I discover something else that's <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, that, like another layer of rotation. I go, never mind, I'm going to keep working <laughs> on this. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so we mentioned regular deadlifts. We, met, we mentioned trap bar deadlifts. We mentioned rack pulls kind of in, indirectly you know, without saying the word rack pull, just the you know, elevated deadlifts. Uh, and then we mentioned single leg RDLs. Uh, what, what about sumos? We haven't really talked much about sumo deadlifts. How, how do they play into this? I like sumo deadlifts. I've been doing quite a bit lately. Um, but it's very similar. It's the same idea. It's like a, kind of like a trap bar. It keeps you a little more upright. Um, with the sumo stance, you're trying to get a little more upright and trying to use the legs a bit more. So think about that ratio, whole thing we were talking about before. We're trying to distribute more of the weight towards our hips and a little less onto our spines. So it's a nice. I mean, I have I write a lot of programming uh, for different gyms, and it's one of the things I wrote into the programming is an off-season portion. You know, um, Nice unload the spine. The spine is taking a beating, right? Like you said, we're using all barbell work. Yeah. So we can unload it a little bit by trying to do um, – something where we're a little more upright, a um, lot more single leg work, a lot of carrying. Um, it's just a, a great exercise, and it's going to fit into that whole spectrum, kind of similar to a uh, trap bar. Uh, the only thing about a sumo that's a little challenging is that it's it's uh, it's a skill, just like anything else, but it's a little tougher to learn and for people to do well in comparison to other barbell lifts, I think. Uh, deadlift is a little bit easier than uh, a sumo, just because it's Excuse me, position-wise. So, if someone's having trouble learning a sumo deadlift, do you have any any ways that you you kind of progress them into that? You know, I don't really have a good answer for that. It's it's honestly something I've kind of not done for about ten years or so, and just started to get back into it and learning more about the coaching of it myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, besides just coaching the lift, I don't really have any really good cues off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Use, yeah. Cool. Uh, something something that we've done over the years, back when me and Mike were were at Faction coaching athletes more on a daily basis, just you know starting people in a rack pull. And then just getting them in a perfect position, top down, and then and then as they achieve a perfect perfect position, just taking more and more mats off where they can get lower and lower and lower. And I feel like that's that works really well for getting people in a perfect position from um, a shorter range of motion towards a longer range of motion, getting them eventually down to the floor. Cool. Yeah. I love I love that term <clears throat> top down. Because mm -hmm. a, a conventional deadlift off the ground, that's really you're trying to get in the most challenging mobility, I guess you could say, position and have to set there and then come up. Versus if you do a rack pull or a Romanian deadlift starting at the top, you can set and then challenge the set as far as, like the set position. 
as far down as you can. And a lot of times that's a great way to get people back into deadlifting too, mm. is start them in the, an easy position to establish. Um, as far as the sumo deadlift goes, the other thing to think about too is it brings your hands closer to the ground. So mm -hmm. you don't have to bend over as far. Yeah. And like Dan has, how long? It's huge. You have a long they wingspan. They called me Condor in high school. So depending kidding. on someone's, I think that someone told me recently this was this was called the ape ratio, like ape like ape mm. is the your uh, your wingspan to height. I guess that's mm. somebody named it that. Mm. Like I have short arms, so for me, compared to Dan, I have to bend forward more. And if I run out of, I mean yeah, if I run out of space in my hip joint or knee joint or ankle joint, I may have to elevate the bar or go sumo or find some variation, and it ends up being the same overall mobility in the hip and knee joint. It's just that. Uh, you know, you, it's just, yeah, exactly. In other sports, I think this is more appreciated. You know, I was watching the, I don't know who you guys are rooting for in the NBA finals, but, you know, if somebody's... <laughs> all, the, all the teams. I'm like a real big fan of uh, all the players and the teams and the coaches. They're good. <laughs> <laughs> but in other you, words, I have no idea who any of those people are. <laughs> but if you think about a guy, <laughs> think about a guy who's seven feet tall and the hoop's, you know, 10 feet. Barely has to jump. Someone right. who's six feet tall, they have to jump way higher. So it's mm. obvious that limb length and height and those things play a huge role in that. And I think we don't appreciate that always as much in, in lifts, where it's like it's it's how far down is it versus how how high is it. How come you can't dunk? <laughs> Five feet tall. Yeah, jeez, yeah. Dan, work on your get, get some get some jump soles and do some drills in your jump soles. Oh man, yeah. I remember those. Yeah, did you used to. Oh yeah. I, oh, I, I, I never those. used them. Did you? I uh, I, I remember seeing them in the to get magazines. Calves used? Oh, huge yeah. calves. I wore them to track practice. I, I did a whole oh, track yeah. practice oh, in yeah. junior high. I can't believe my coaches let me do this. Actually, <laughs> they I did didn't the, know either. Though. Yeah, That's yeah. The <laughs> I did the whole day of track practice in jump soles. Oh fuck. Oh. So just Google this stuff if you don't know what we're talking about. Keeps you on your toes. The whole time. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? What? <laughs> the, the, jump the jump soles? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, from I, your I pers did. from your perspective now. I think that I shouldn't have worn them for the whole practice, <laughs> <laughs> but I did okay in high jump, which is my event, so I don't know. <laughs> Worked Maybe out. Maybe you did well because of the jump soles. <laughs> <laughs> think about that. How do you are, modify are people, jump soles? Are people still using those? Is that like I, I remember I, seeing them in the back of magazines. That's right. That's Russell. Russell. I haven't seen them in a long time though. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I was just. I was like, I gotta jump higher. I gotta jump higher. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if anybody uses big them calves. Anymore. That's that's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably more like the plyometric program that they put you on rather yes, than necessarily they your calves they getting you getting jacked. Yeah. Wear this and then do this program that you weren't doing before. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's, like, it's like buying the thigh master and then they send you like a book of nutrition and then like you lose a bunch of weight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Which so, was it really? So before the show, we were we were talking about scaling and that, and that terminology and kind of what that means. And just a yeah. second ago, you were, we were talking about rack pulls and like, you know, the the diameter of a bumper plate or the radius of a bumper plate is the same for everybody. So right. if you're seven feet tall, you, you have to you have to like go so far down where if you're five feet tall, then it's like, right, just below the knee, you yeah. know? Right? And so the five foot tall person, of course, is gonna be much more likely that they can get to a perfect position because it's just simply easier for them. They're doing a rack pull in a sense compared to the seven foot guy, right? So for in, from your perspective and your opinion, like, like, Using the word scaling is that is that hurting or helping at this point? Because a lot of people they don't they don't want to scale something. That's like you're fucked up and you got to do something <laughs> different than everybody else because you're a wuss. Or is you, if you you're say not like, as good as them. Yeah, like what if if I scale a workout for somebody? What what I'm really doing is I'm like I'm optimizing this workout specifically for you. And it's like it's a good thing. Like yeah. I'm making this workout better for your very specific oh, situation. Shit. And then and then and then you get res then what I get resistance. Words. Like I don't want to I don't want to do this workout. This is like specifically tailored to me. But of course that's like the best thing I could have possibly done for you but still people don't want to do it because they don't want to feel like they're an outsider or they're yeah. not as cool as everybody else so like what do we do about that well I think scaling could be used in the like when it's an actual competition there's going to be the main competition competition and then there will be the the divisions that aren't doing that so I think in that term in that sense scaling might I mean maybe that is the best word but for training I really like the optimization. I know. I feel like I, I'm you, like, you said can it. I get you to program for me? Like, <laughs> I just, I really want it, that. And then Ryan and I looked at each other and we're like, wow, fuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, he took it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think of them as training options rather than scales. So, you know, yeah, let's say today you know, we're doing deadlifts and uh, I just my back hurts. I can't do deadlifts off the ground without it hurting. What's the better training option that's going to still allow me to get a benefit and that's I wouldn't call that scaling. So I think this, the term scaling, there is a connotation there of, eh, I'm just not actually able to do the thing I'm supposed to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's really not about that right now because this is a training session. This isn't a competition. This is training. What are we going to do today to have the best training session? And that's really, 
it's like a service, as you mentioned. It's, I'm doing the best thing I could do for you by giving you this training option mm -hmm. rather than make the workout easier. Yeah. Because maybe I'm, that's... I'm sorry. It's like it's. I'm not giving you a different, a different workout. I'm sorry. I'm not giving you a different version of that workout. I'm giving you a brand new workout. Mm. So it has nothing to do with the old workout. This is a brand new workout that's similar, but better for you. Yeah. I, yeah. I think That's people great. need to be educated about it, you know. They have to know that it's a good thing to change things um, to make you a better athlete and not get hurt in the long run, you know. And you also have to create a, a gym culture that's okay with that, you know. it's Most people, did they want to do the workout on the board, right. But as a coach, you tell someone, hey, look, what's on the board might not be the best thing. Like, we can't write the best programming for every single person here. We have to modify. We have to change. We have to adapt. Everyone has different goals. Not everyone goes to CrossFit games. Like, it's all different. People need to, to know that their training is going to be different on a regular basis, right. And I think... Uh, the coaches just have to I don't think coaches are against that in any way but I think sometimes the athletes feel that way right because what ends up happening is that an athlete will get hurt right and they come to me and I was like did you tell Eric that your shoulder hurt it's like no no it's just you know tight just do this I'm sure we've all seen that someone comes off a pull-up bar and they're like this they do this a couple times and they're like how's your shoulder feel and they're like it's good it's tight you know <laughs> and they go and they do weird, more you look internally rotated all the time <laughs> Yeah, right. So I think it's it's really important that the coach is just open. Like, someone hurts, tell me, right? Because you can see it. I, I, you know, coaching, I just walk around like, does your shoulder hurt? They're like, yeah, it's hurt me a bunch, you know? Um, and I think that uh, a lot of times coaches just don't hear it, right? Because they're not asking about it. And we're maybe it's a little intimidating for the athlete to say that. But if you create that culture within your gym and say, hey, if something hurts, you got to tell me, you know, this is, we're going to hurt you further and further. So people keep on banging their head against the wall, you know, day after day week after week and I'm sure you've all seen it right be like oh yeah. there's Joe his shoulder always hurts always you know I think you were you got into it at the beginning of your explanation right there and uh what it sounds like to me is setting the expectations when athletes come in the culture piece right so setting the culture in your gym as a coach a lot of that has to do with setting expectations from the very beginning because what people are experiencing the first month or two that they're in the box is pretty much going to set their impression of what the culture is. So from day one, you're you're approaching it uh, and setting expectations that things are going to be changing for everyone all the time in the workouts, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good. But if you're already running a gym or you're coaching at a gym where there's 200 athletes and that's never been the culture, it's going to take a lot of work to get that shifted. And it's yeah. probably going to take some turnover to get new athletes in there. And uh, I, I think it's a really good idea to set those expectations from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean... You could definitely do that. One of the easy things we did at uh, at Verve when I was coaching over there is that just at the start of every class, like, who's hurting? Does anyone look at this board and, like, feel like this is not going to be a good workout? And then, like, all the coaches know, like, oh, Joe's got, you know, plantar fasciitis. We can't really run. we got to make sure we get the rower out for him or something like that. Yeah. Then you have meetings about the same stuff that we're trying to talk about. It's like, okay, what are your modifications for a guy that has knee pain, right? Quick on the spot. We need to do this fast because you're coaching and you've got, like, 15 athletes. You can't. You know, sit down and, all right, what should we do? All right, uh, you know, you got to be quick about your modifications, you, the sets, the reps, whatever it is happens on the spot, you know. And then what happens is that athlete, you'll get a, a flavor of what they can handle, what they can't. And then the other coaches are on board with that, and we know just based on the people. At Verve, we had like a, it was like an Excel sheet or something, people that were hurt and what was going on, so they could they could catch up on these people if they are having problems too. So um, it's important, right, because we want to make sure that people are getting better and not getting hurt. And from a business perspective, you've got a lot of members at least because something hurts you know yeah some of the you know one of the most valuable things I think I do for coaches is I keep people in the gym and if they're gone I get them back you know um, so yeah you were talking before we hopped on the mics about uh, Paul who he's a games athlete and he almost always changes the workouts yeah uh, uh, Paul Bono if you guys don't know he's a good buddy of mine he's a real cool guy um, he's currently in CrossFit Verve and uh, I kind of got to know him there but I actually competed at him in uh, New Jersey. Quick story, I beat him in a competition once. <laughs> Gotta <laughs> say that, yeah. Paul. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just add that in. So you guys don't know about this. Wipe that Paul on so he can talk shit back. <laughs> Paul's like 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. He's a pretty short guy, right? And he got like first or second place in all the events except for a uh, triple broad jump. <laughs> snuck in past him on that one, which was good. Uh, but anyway, I mean, he was on uh, CrossFit Milford 2015 when they won the games. He was a team captain. Uh, he weighs like 165, but he can clean and jerk like 330, I think, snatches around 260. He's, he's got a great engine, too. Just a phenomenal athlete, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, he was being coached by Jay Lydon. I think he follows a lot of Matt Chan's programming now, or he was at least at the time. Um, but anyway, this guy, he always said, I modify every single workout, you know. And he uses the term modify, but in, in reality, he looks at a workout, and he's like, you know, 
this is not feeling great today. And keep in mind, it's like a 24-year-old guy, right? So it's not like it's a 42-year-old who's been beat up. It's a 24-year-old who's pretty fresh. They got those fresh joints, right? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> every single workout he went into, he looked at it, He's like, you know what? This has not been feeling very good lately. I need to make a little tweak here. I need to change this. This is a little too much volume. I need to – and it's just – he learned about his body over time to the point that he knew what was probably best for him, right? And uh, his coach can still say, like, look, Paul, I think you need to push this. You can't just skimp on this, like, row piece or whatever is here. But it wasn't that necessarily. It's just that he knew that certain things were a little too much volume in certain areas, and he's been down that path before where he did too much squatting, his knee hurts, or did too much overhead press, back starts hurt, whatever it is. So he made that change on the spot that was best for him to continue. Um, so I guess the analogy you're making is, like, you got a guy in front of you, and the guy's like, man, I really want to do RX, right? person's like six months into, into CrossFit. It's like, well, yeah. do you know Paul, right? Coach Paul. And they're like, yeah, I know Coach Paul. He's like, you know, he modifies every single workout. And I was like, oh, I, I had no idea that was happening. But once they make that connection, like, wow, so the best athletes in the world are making changes on a regular basis that are going to optimize my training. I'm like, oh, well, now they're much more likely to do it because it, it makes that connection to them. Yeah, and, and Paul is more than likely going to be competing for a lot longer because of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure yeah I think to bring it back to what's the person's goal and why are they going to the gym and if you can say like the, we're changing this workout because it actually helps you meet that goal better yeah. and and to switch that rather than like oh you have to you know we got to make it easier for you we got to change it but you bring it back to the thing that's helping them and how mm. it's helping them I think then they go oh yeah okay well that's what I want you know I don't want my shoulder to hurt and this is going to help my shoulder feel better sooner so yeah I want to do that definitely so bringing it back to that is uh, I think incredibly valuable psychologically yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, so the two of you you guys collaborated on a course together is that correct yep we yep. did we were uh, at uh OCF O'Hare CrossFit with Angelo Cisco. I know you guys. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, are, uh, good buddy of ours. And Angelo, and uh, once a year he has a uh, essentially a, a coaches summit for uh, his his staff. And uh, I think you've done that three times. I've done it twice. And yeah. this most recent time, we wanted to uh, collaborate to bring something that would be a, a really valuable resource to their staff. And uh, we, after a lot of discussion, decided it would be how do we teach these modifications for back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, etc., for different lifts so that uh, the coaches and trainers can quickly reference this and go, oh, this this is bad Let's uh, or painful, let's, let's find the one on this list and go through this order so we can quickly figure out how to change it for this athlete. And that way, too, the staff could all be on the same page mm-hmm. where they're kind of following the same system. So uh, that's what we did over there, and we filmed the whole thing and made it into an online course so that we could make it available to uh, anybody who wants to learn more about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I've seen the course. I, I love it. I think it's all really good information. Uh, if somebody wanted to check that out, where would they go? Yeah, they can find that at the movementfix.com and uh, forward slash modifying. So if they go there, or they just go to the moveitfix.com and go to the shop button, it's it's the top listed item there. That would be where you can find out uh, more info. There's some videos on there too to show like kind of what it looks like, so people can get a feel for what it is. And yeah, you have anything to add to that? I gotta tell you, it's it's basically the product that I I wish I had when I was a trainer, right? And this is you know it's it's this huge gray area, right? No one wants to talk about it. So basically, what we do on a daily basis, physical therapists, chiropractors, we work with people in pain all the time, right? And then as you know, personal trainers, coaches, what do people tell you about pain? Refer out, refer out. You know, that's not your place. Don't do anything with this person. But a couple things happen. You're going to work with that person in pain, right? You're just modifying things. You're changing stuff. So the good coaches kind of figure it out on their own, right? Um, but what ends up happening is that people really don't know what they're doing. And no one is saying, like, look, these are the steps you have to take in order to get better, right? Obviously, still work with professional, but I still need to work with you. We have to make sure that we're not screwing you up further, right? And we're still trying to reach your goals. You know, just because you're in pain doesn't mean we have to stop training completely. Just we need someone to help us out along that spectrum. And as therapists, chiropractors do it every day, and there's some simple, basic, easy things about biomechanics and the way you lift and some of the pathologies or injuries we see, that we can make these easy tweaks, and you can make someone continue getting better, better, better without hurting them in the process. You know, so that's it. Right on. Uh, very cool. If, if people want to reach out to you, what's your what's your social websites, etc.? Yeah. So uh, on Instagram at the Move It Fix, and then uh, Facebook also the Move It Fix, and contact info is on uh, the Move If people have questions, want to reach out, you can Dan, find me there. Right on. Dan, 
Yeah, fitnesspainfree.com. I've been blogging for probably eight or nine years. There's a ridiculous amount of stupid information on there. Damn, um, that's a long there's time. A lot of great, long time. There's a lot of great information Dude, on there's there. There's so much on there. I remember we were going through that. It's kind of crazy. Uh, but Instagram, Fitness Pain Free. I'm also on Twitter, but I never check that. I'm on Facebook, too, but I'm real bad with, with Facebook as well. So Don't tell people that. Yeah, we, we've, I'm we've given up on Twitter as well. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter's like the auto post. Auto post. Have it, just have the thing auto post to Twitter. That's, 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 that's the bitch, I think I'm the that's the only bitch one out of all here, social media. Like, and I'm the only one on my team that's like active on Twitter. Yeah. Like, I have conversations there every day. Yeah. I don't know. It's good. It, I just don't stay up to date. <laughs> that's where the good shit's happening. Yeah. yeah. That's the good Twitter. shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us, all right, guys. Fellas. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. You right. And uh, you. make sure you subscribe over on YouTube. Go to iTunes. Five star review. Positive comments only. <laughs> And uh, where else? Yeah, sounds good. And we'll see you next week. Yeah.